Uh, tonight's workshop speaker is a contest mastery charter member, a well-known voice and performance skills coach, and the 2019 District 106 Toastmaster of the Year. Presenting the making of a tall tale, please welcome the vocal Jim, Jim Emery. Thank you, George. And thank you all the rest of you for being here this evening and sharing in this workshop. Each one of us gives speeches. That's why we're in Toastmasters. And whether they're contest speeches or not, most of the preparation for that is get your content, get it, get it put together, make sure it hangs together and practice your delivery skills. If you have great content and great delivery skills, chances are you're going to do very well. And that certainly goes in contests as well. Then the pandemic happened. And all of a sudden we find ourselves giving speeches, especially contest speeches, in this little tiny video window uh, that Zoom provides us. And not only are we speakers now, but we turn into TV producers of that whole, that whole experience that the people at the other end participate in. So we're gonna to look tonight at some of the behind the scenes factors that come into that, uh, and hopefully inspire you to be a little creative on that front as well. All right, you should see slides on the screen now. The, I'll give you a hint. The action of the rest of the workshop is all in the slides. You're welcome to look at my face if you want to, but I think with optimum viewing, I would maximize the amount of your screen space that is dedicated to the slides. It'll make watching the videos in particular a lot more enjoyable. So as we get to looking at the experience we're about to look at. This is, an, in effect, a documentary. This is, is how I made my tall tale. So you, it, this is not necessarily one where we're going to say you need to do this and don't do that. But hopefully you'll get some ideas by what you saw in terms of the, of the things that I did in preparing my tall tale speech last fall that will sp spur some of your own creativity. Before we go too far into the behind the scenes though, I would like you to actually see first the finished product. So relax just a little bit for about five minutes while I present to you Shootout at the OK Garage. Shootout at the OK Garage. Shootout at the OK Garage. Jim Emery. I could almost hear someone whistling the theme to the good, the bad, and the ugly. There was an amazing amount of tension for a car dealership service waiting room. The two men, both 60 something, glared at each other. With contempt. One, his name was Sam, was there when I arrived. He'd been watching the morning show on CNN. The other, his name was Frank, arrived after me and wanted to change the channel to watch Fox News. Well, the first guy, Sam, said that he preferred not to change the channel. Mm -mm. Apparently, them was fighting words. Fiery fox man Frank flung out phrases like fake news and liberal bias and mainstream media while cynical CNN Sam struck back strongly, stating to Foxman Frank, you ought to form an opinion of your own sometime. Astonishingly, neither man's insults 
change the other's opinion or the channel. <laughs> it went on like this for longer than a nervous Toastmaster newbie giving an icebreaker speech. A flurry of sarcastic and indignant words went from one to the other. And then, tense silence. It reminded me of an old Western with two gunslingers in a showdown. The six shooter, or in this case, the TV remote, sat on the table between them. With steely eyes, they stared at each other. One looked down at the remote and then back at his opponent. The other looked at the remote and then up again. Hands twitched, lips quivered. But neither man pulled the trigger. For some reason, CNN Sam and Foxman Frank both turned to me. I guessed they wanted me to break the tie and choose the channel. Well, being a person of great courage, I leaned over and picked up the remote. The tension was palpable as I considered my options. Should I start my day with CNN or Fox? CNN or Fox? CNN or Fox? Which was it? Which was it going to be? The two men stared at me intently, waiting my decision. CNN? or Fox. Then when the tension reached its breaking point, I pointed the remote at the set and turned it off. Boom, it was done. Turning off the TV really irked them, but I had the remote, so tough cookies. Just then, a little four-year-old girl walked up sheepishly. Please, sir, could you turn on SpongeBob? You bet I can. Mr. Toastmaster. Okay, so that is the finished product. Let's look a little bit now behind the scenes. The first thing that I needed to do in putting this together was actually choose the room that I was going to do it in. My initial thought was simply to do it in my office because that's where everything is set up for all of my Zoom meetings. I've got a nice background there with blinds and plants and the lights are all set up. And it seemed like, well, that might not be too bad a case. But if you remember from the speech, I did a fair amount of moving around and there were two main characters besides me plus the little girl. I needed a little room. And as I looked at the space behind my desk, and the desk is really hard to move, I just decided this is too small. So I couldn't do it in my office. So my next option was my living room. Now this room, as you can tell, has quite a bit more space. It's a decent looking room, has potential. And I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe this will work. In particular, it has plenty of floor space both for me to move around in and also to set up uh, my equipment, camera and, and all of that. So I decided that the living room was perfect. So now that I've decided on the living room, I needed to decide on the background. 
This is the background I decided was probably the best. It's the fireplace and, uh, and the mantle uh, around it. it. Has a very nice symmetry to it, a rectangular, almost proscenium arch for those of you who are theater people. But there is one problem in this background. I'll zoom in and see if you can tell what the, what the problem is. The problem is that picture on the wall. Now, there's nothing wrong with the picture itself, except that it's too interesting. And in particular, if you put me in front of it, now you see I have four Salukis coming out of the top of my head and this little uh, youthful Buddhist monk looking over his shoulder, watching the entire production. This just had to go. So although I love the picture, the picture had to go. So with the picture removed, we're back looking again at the living room area where I'll be doing the, the basically the production, but with the picture gone. Now, I'll be standing in front of the fireplace, looking out away from it, and uh, about at where that circle is on the rug. And so there's plenty of room there, but obviously the furniture is a bit troublesome. Well, that's easy to fix. We move the furniture out of the way. Now I have a ton of room here in which to start. So the next thing I look at is lighting. One of the rules in lighting is that you want to get the brightest light sources you can that don't blind you and put two of them, one each at 45 degree angles from the object being illuminated. So if I'm standing in front of that, uh, that fireplace, then 45 degrees out from that little circle on the rug is about where I want to put the lights. So I put the first light at the corner on one side over by the stairs going upstairs, and I put the other light over at the other corner, um, both of them 45 degrees. Now, these are nice uh, softbox lights. Uh, if you have these, use them. If you don't, not a big problem, but get the light, brightest light source that you can and have two of them at 45 degrees. Okay, so lighting's done now. So now let's build up some more structure. The first piece of structure is a step ladder. What on earth do you want a step ladder for? Well, think again, I'm standing during this entire speech. And one of the rules about video, again, is that you want the lens of your camera as close to eye level as possible. And the stepladder had that nice little fold out shelf that is just a perfect spot to put my laptop. Now with the laptop there, the lens on my laptop is in the middle top of the screen of the laptop here, which is serendipitously right at my eye level. So if I'm looking at from the front side here, I can look right at the lens as if I were looking right in the eyes of someone in the audience. So computer's all ready to go. Let's look at props now. I had a number of props in this speech. I needed to put them somewhere. So I have a little props table. This is simply a wooden fold up tray table. Uh, it, it is a uh, hard surface wood and it is a, a, has a lacquered finish on the top. You can see where I put it in front of this, uh, the step ladder. I put, so I put it as close to the camera as I can, uh, but still having it where I need to be able to reach it. Now, one of the things about the surface of this props table is because it's hard wood, if I put something down on it, like let's say that hard plastic uh, TV remote, it makes a noise. Well, I don't want it to make a noise. And also that surface is a little bit slippery. So I, I can solve both of those problems pretty easily. All I did was I took a, a hand towel, folded it once, draped it over the front side of the table. Now I can put the prop down on the hand towel. It doesn't make any noise and it certainly won't slip off the table. So the props are great. Now, so are we ready to put props on? Yes, but I'm gonna take a right turn quickly and talk about audio. In particular, I would talk about microphones. My experience, yours may be different, my experience is that cameras on laptops generally are quite good. Microphones on laptops often are not. 
And so I tested the microphone on my laptop, didn't like the sound I got. So instead I'm using here uh, an external USB mic. Uh, this one happens to be a Blue Yeti. There's all kinds of choices. Amazon is full of them at any particular price point. Since it's a USB mic, you see a black cord coming out of it. That's the USB cable and it kind of squirrels up it through the step ladder and plugs into the USB port on the laptop. So now I'm in great shape audio wise. This mic picks me up no matter where I am in the room. So now we can go back and put the props on the props table. So you see the TV remote on the bottom right here. That's the the six shooter in my in my speech. Above that, you see a little crib sheet. Everybody needs a crib sheet. This is to tell me, make sure my camera's on, make sure I'm off mute, and a number of other things that I just needed to make sure uh, were right before I actually started the speech. Uh, at the bottom left is another prop that I'll talk about in a minute. Some of you who do a lot of speeches probably know what that is already. And above it is the case for it. Now, is this all the props? No the cowboy hat still has to go somewhere. And the cowboy hat is too big to fit on this little table easily. So enter the prop stool. This was also a little wooden stool that I had in the basement. It's kind of like a bar stool. And again, its height is, is really nice. I can reach uh, it, things on it very easily. And the top is just the right size to put a cowboy hat on. All right, so now I am indeed completely ready. Here are all the props that I need. Uh, am I now done building up the structure for this production? No, I'm not. Next piece of structure is a tripod. In fact, a tripod with an interesting adapter on the top. And that adapter holds my iPad. Now, what on earth do I need an iPad for? This is where I'll make a confession. I am not the world's greatest memorizer. And in particular, early on in the contest cycle at the club contest, before I made it to division, I was having difficulty remembering everything in my speech. And I had had an experience in the past where I got stuck in a, in a speech and spent 20 of the most uncomfortable seconds of my life trying to get back on, on track. So what's the iPad for? it runs a teleprompter application. And this in particular, you can see the script on there. This in particular is a great application because this one has voice recognition in it. So it doesn't scroll at a constant rate. It listens to what I am saying and scrolls at the rate I am presenting. So if you look the first sentence there, after that good, bad, and the ugly, that's where the music started and I started cavorting around in, in a big white space there. It simply waits until it hears me say, there was an amazing amount of tension. Ah, we're back on track and it starts scrolling again. So I have a teleprompter. Where am I going to put it? I've tried initially to put it over on the side and high, but I discovered through practice that it was really noticeable when I looked over to the side. So instead I have it right in front of the camera. I have it as high as possible without the iPad actually encroaching in the video uh, itself. So you never saw the iPad, but it was always just off camera down below the video image. All right, do we have all the structure now? No, we have one more piece. There's a little step stool over there on the side. What's that for? Well, if you think about how you use a laptop in a contest, you have to log into the Zoom meeting and you go into the, the, the breakout rooms for, uh, for the briefings and you have to get on and off mute. Uh, there's a lot of interacting with your computer. Now, if the computer's up at, at eye level, it's really hard to interact with the keyboard and, and the touchpad up there. So this little step stool just allows me to take a step up or two so that I can get up and, and use the computer for all those other things other than just being the camera. So now that is the entire structure of all the stuff that I had for the speech. Let's now look at that audio, that audio of the good, bad, and the ugly theme. How did I do that? My first thought was I was going to use my iPhone and I would just hit the play button on my iPhone, it would play it. 
Uh, I tried that, but it didn't work well for a couple reasons. One was that it's really noticeable when you look down at your phone or you bring your phone up in view to hit the play button. I didn't want to do that. That distraction would would have destroyed the mood. The other thing is that the touch sensitivity on the iPhone uh, isn't 100% reliable, so I might have ended up punching it several times to get it to work. So I have a different solution here. What I have here that you're looking at is a Keynote slide deck. Now, for those of you who aren't Macintosh people, Keynote is Apple's uh, equivalent of PowerPoint. So you can just think of this as a five slide PowerPoint deck. The first slide is just a title slide to remind me what the deck is. And then the next four slides are all, are all identical. There's nothing on them uh, that you see, but of course nobody's going to see this anyway. But each of them has an embedded audio. And the embedded audio is that good, bad, and the ugly theme that I played at the beginning of the end. So why are there four of these? Well. I'm going to go from slide to slide to play each time. So when I go from slide one to slide two, I have configured it to auto play the embedded audio in slide two. Then when I go from slide two to slide three, it will do the same thing and it will play again. Now, if you remember from the speech, I played the audio twice. So slide two and slide three get used, one at the beginning, one at the end. I've been in technology long enough to know that things go wrong. So slides four and five there are just extras in case something went wrong. Now, if I'm gonna get the audio by advancing slides, how do I advance the slides without crawling up and interacting with my keyboard or my touchpad on the laptop? Here is where the final prop comes in. This is a wireless remote. This is a very common thing that public speakers use all the time, especially speakers maybe who speak in big auditoriums where they're not going to be anywhere near the laptop that has their slides on them. You see it has some direction keys there. All those are for is to go forward or backward in your PowerPoint file. So going to the next slide, in my case to play the audio, was really easy. All I had to hit, do was hit that button. So now that I'm all set, I, if I bring up a Zoom uh, account, this is or a, a meeting, this is what it looks like on my screen. Now I'm not in costume here, but you can see I have a Zoom meeting going on with me on the screen. And then up to the right there overlaid on it is the slideshow mode of that keynote deck that has the audio slides in it. If you look a little ways further back, you can see the same thing, but with the teleprompter in front. This is pretty much the view that I had while I was doing my speech. So now you get kind of a feeling for all of the technology that I used. Let's look a little bit at how I actually used it. So <laughs> I've got a few videos here. The, I'll call them my slate of hand videos that will show you just what was going on when I used some of the technologies. Now, the first one was at the beginning of the, of the speech, I had that wireless remote in my hand so that I could play the music because I only had one sentence and then I played the music. But now I want to get rid of it. I don't want that remote in my hand for the rest of the speech. So I need to drop it. So I have a video here, two videos here, one that will show you what the audience saw and then another that will show you what was actually going on. Shoot up at the OK Garage, Jim Emery. I could almost hear someone whistling the theme to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now here's another view. I could almost hear someone whistling the theme to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's the drop.
pretty seamless, right? You couldn't see my hand dropping it. I worked really hard to keep my eyes on the camera so there wouldn't be a distraction, and yet I got rid of that wireless remote. The next one is I need to pick up the cowboy hat. I don't start with it, but I need it later in the, uh, in the speech. So here is what the audience saw and what actually happened. Tense. Silence. It reminded me of an old western with two gunslingers in a showdown. And here's the other view. Tense. Silence. Reminded me of an old Western with two gunslingers. So that's the cowboy hat. The next one is I need to pick up the TV remote or the six shooter as I called it. This one is actually the easiest of the four because the script itself says that I bent over to pick up the TV remote. But here again is what the audience saw and what was going on out of camera. Well, being a person of great courage, I leaned over and picked up the remote. Being a person of great courage, I leaned forward and picked up the remote. Pretty straightforward. So I only have one more. Since I play the music at the end on my exit, I need to get get that, that wireless remote back in my hand to move to the next slide to play the audio. So this is, again, what the audience saw and what was going on behind the scenes for the pickup. You bet I can. Now watch closely and see where the remote goes here. You bet I can. So at the end of that one, even though the wireless remote was in my hand, I was showing you the back of my hand and kind of misdirecting your eyes to watch me shoot the TV remote instead. So almost no one would actually ever see what was going on there. So that is the making of my tall tale. I hope that I've inspired a little bit of creativity as you approach your, especially your next contest, where you'll be standing up and doing uh, something maybe like what I've done here. You certainly don't have to do what I did or use all of the things that I, I used. You also don't need to be constrained by that. Certainly feel free to be creative on your own. Uh, but when you're all done, I'm sure you're, not only will your speech go well and will your delivery go well, but you will be so proud of the production that you put together that you're going to want to play the credits at the end. Okay, so are there any questions? I'm still only on yellow, so we have a little bit of time. Uh, if I, I'm not sure I can see all of you. Maybe if I go into gallery view, I can. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Wayne has a question, go for it. How do you start the thing? Say it's a contest, do you walk in there or do you just turn something on and, and you're there? Like, How do you start? Well, in the Zoom environment, usually what happens, not always, but usually what happens is that the, the Toastmaster 
is on camera when you get introduced. So as you saw here, actually Ed Aylward, our own Ed Aylward was the uh, Toastmaster at this contest. And so the introduction of my speech, he was on, on, uh, on camera. Then what usually happens is that the first sound that I make is what causes Zoom to transfer over to be my video image instead of his. So rather than try to make an entrance and have what I call dead air at that point, uh, I started right exactly where my first line was going to be delivered. So when, a, when after the, uh, the MC introduction was done, uh, I just took off. Other questions? Oh, another front one from Wayne. Go for it. Well, if someone else had one, I'd say, you use music. Yep. Hey, it's a contest. Yep. Is that allowable? No, nobody cared. Okay. Props and audio are allowed. Oh, what was that? Props and audio are allowed in the contest. It's like they always have been. Okay. Then last question. You mean even in the international contest? It just that gives is. more chances of something going wrong. It was considerably less than 25% of his content. Probably the only the only possible objection was I didn't give credit to, to Ennio Morricone, who was the composer of it. But uh, I, I don't think anybody particularly cared. So we're at red. So uh, I am out of time here. If you do have some other um, some other questions though, or you'd maybe just like to brainstorm some of your own staging, I'd love to do whatever I can to help you. I've put my contact information into the chat. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time and we'll have some fun brainstorming together. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster.